Thank you, and thank you, Ayan. Thank you, Quadbridge, for having me here. And um, I, I'm going to flip that on its head a little bit. I thought about doing a trends and things uh, like that, but I decided I'm going to talk a little bit more about zero trust because not zero trust in a product sense by any stretch of the imagination, but talking about it in that it's something that we should have been doing all along. Um, and before I get too far down the road, I want to say thank you for having me uh, and thank you for taking time out of your day to be here. I really do appreciate that. All right, let's see how this clicker action goes. All right, so quick few things about myself. I have been in this industry for one shape or another for over 25 years. Mm -hmm. I have done everything from being an acting uh, CISO right down to being a firewall admin and everything in between. And it's really amazing the things that I have seen over the years with all the different types of uh, roles that I've had. I've done work for defense contractors in the US. I've done work for various organizations globally. And it has really opened my eyes to all the different things and also the commonalities that I find around the world of the problems that people have and the problems that people share. Um, and one of the really interesting things I learned on very early on was that my uh, mentor back in the day told me I should always carry a notebook with me everywhere I go and write everything down. The really interesting thing is, is after doing that for 25 years, I've got a stack of notebooks about this high, and it really gives me the opportunity to write all kinds of stories for publications like Forbes and other things like that, and of course with the names of the guilty parties removed. So the few things about me you should know, uh, yes, I am a hacker, boo. Um, really interesting how the world sees hackers. Yep, yep, yeah, they don't like us a whole lot because, you know, that's unfortunate. The really funny thing is, is hacker, in my way of looking at things, is somebody with an innate curiosity about security uh, or things in general. So I, I tend to look at it in much different format. I am Canadian, uh, born and raised in Montreal, actually. I grew up and I lived in Laval and DDO. Thank you. So I really like coming back. So this is how weird things have gotten. So as part of my role, uh, role with Duo Security, um, we do a lot of authentication, authorization, all that sort of fun stuff, but this here is a tattoo that I have on this arm, and I took a picture of it simply because I didn't want to roll up my sleeve. This is the direct result of, uh, I was standing in a hotel lobby in Delhi about two years ago, and this lady came up, she was all very well dressed, and she said, excuse me, are you an American? I said, no, I'm actually from Canada. She goes, oh good. I've never been so alarmed in all my life. And I thought, okay, there's got to be some way that I can authenticate myself in the future if that ever thing sort of comes up again. So rather than putting a patch on a backpack, I decided I was going to go full hog and put a Canadian maple leaf on my arm. So this is how I like to describe Canadians to the rest of the world when I'm out there, that we lure, dress up as homicidal maniacs and run across the ice at a high rate of speed when we are doing our sort of thing. So as I mentioned, I started with Duo, and then a few months after joining Duo, uh, these guys came along and bought us up, which has actually turned out to be a really good thing. Now, we have our products are available on our website currently on the Cisco.com, but this is where it gets really interesting. This is how my boss articulated to me. She went, we've got Duo, we have Cisco, and well, it's more like a disco. The, m the marketing teams didn't really go for it, but you know what, I'm going to keep saying it until they shoot me. So our mission is really simple, to help protect your mission. Now, zero trust, what does it mean? It really is about going it right back to the core fundamentals that we started with when we started doing this thing 25, 30 plus years ago, and looking at things like network zone segmentation, assuming hostile intent, <coughs> bastion hosts, all of these things are items that we have talked about over the years. But somehow along the way, we sort of lost our way and then somebody was able to articulate it in a much better fashion and this is where we come to now. <laughs> we have to assume everything is on fire, everything is hostile. Jericho Forum was a group that actually uh, articulated deperimatization back in 2007, and it was really interesting because prior to that, there had been all sorts of conversations in various organizations I worked at about doing bastion hosts and basically get doing away with DMZs and all the rest. And as we've gone through time, John Kindervog did a great service to us collectively by putting the label zero trust. And why I say that is because he helped put it in terms that people can understand. They made it, it may seem overly simple, but it works, and it works very well. Then along came Google with their Beyond Corp, and then later on we had a book from O'Reilly that just came out two years ago uh, that is a really good book. Now, now, this particular book, I have no affiliation with the author or anything like that, but if you want to learn more, this is a great resource to check out. Um, and no, I don't get any kickback or residuals from that statement. 
Now, Beyond Corp is Google's version of doing zero trust, and they have put out a, a great paper that uh, if you haven't read it, I would definitely recommend having a look at it. It's basically a way of better securing your environment by doing all those core fundamentals that we should have been doing all along and applying them to your environment. And later on, they actually went back and did a new paper, and they did an uh, examination of the lessons learned. Now, this is something that more organizations and individuals should do collectively, is learning from their mistakes. If you have a mistake that you've suffered through, articulate it, right? share it with others, because guaranteed somebody out there is going to have the exact same problem. I know I've been there, done that. The traditional approach to security has always been the perimeter. We have a castle, we have a moat. Great. The zero trust idea is to authenticate and verify everything. Users, devices, networks. This is the way to the future. Because we have to look at, we always love our triads. We have our CIA triad and all that sort of fun stuff. But this is a really simple way of looking at it. The visibility and policy, and uh, apparently I kind of goofed on the visibility. But the apps, devices, and users, these are the core fundamentals when you boil it right down. You want to start with confirming the identities of the people in your environment. You want to make sure that those are the folks that are supposed to be accessing these devices. A static password isn't going to do it. It really actually never could do it. It was just assuming that somebody had that correct credential. All the way through to securing access to the applications in your environment or external to your environment that are being used by your staff. When people talk about zero trust, I love to say this. What is love? If you ask a room with 100 people in it, what is love, you're going to get 100 different answers. And very much in the same vein, zero trust has come to that point where it is, oh, yeah, well, it's this, it's this, it's this. The idea here is it's something to aspire to, something where we can do a better job of securing our environments and our assets. But this is the best way to look at it as zero trust. This is the very simple way to put it right down. Everything is on fire, and you can move on from there. It's a growth thing. And as a security practitioner, this is how we feel on a consistent basis every single day, or at least that's how I feel most of the time. The fundamental lesson that I've learned over the years is that castles simply don't scale. That is not a sustainable model. And just because it's behind your firewall, you can't trust it. Years and years ago, I had this wonderful uh, conversation with the CIO where they said, it's OK, we have a firewall. And all the assets inside, it's OK. We trust all of our users. And I was like, it's not the users I'm concerned about so much as somebody trusting that user from the outside and getting in. Now, we're all big fans of being in re uh, recycling, environmentally conscious, and all that sort of things. Please do not apply this sort of thinking to passwords. Reusing usernames and passwords on multiple sites is a very bad thing to do. Look at things like password managers. Educate your user base on a better way to do it at the core basis of it. You can move on to that to multi-factor authentication and other steps like that. But doing sharing static passwords within an environment, not a great idea. I was actually giving a talk in Las Vegas about two years ago, and I was standing in line to give a talk about data breaches and all these sort of fun things. And right in front of me, uh, as I was getting my coffee before I gave my talk, there were two folks talking about how they shared all their usernames and passwords in a text file on an open share on their network. They just happened to be sitting in the front row of my talk about 10 minutes later, and they went beat red when I called them out without naming them. And I said, oh, I just happened to be getting a coffee, and they basically just wanted to die and have the entire earth suck them back in. This is something that is we can educate our users and make sure that we move away from this sort of mentality. A password is very, very simple. It is very basic. It has served its purpose, and its purpose is done. Now we have to move beyond that. Because the idea is, you, you, this is my authentication, but it doesn't actually say who you are. It just says that you have the password. And if you were able to meet the challenge, they'll let you in. Otherwise, they'll taunt you and send you away. And there's lessons from history. This is one of those things that I find absolutely gobsmacking when I look back at it. So before I ever got into cybersecurity in any way, shape, or form, I actually was a student of archaeology. And one of the lessons that I learned while I was in university was about the, the fall of Rome. In 410 AD, the Visigoths sacked the city, and how they did it was they used their own security against them. They surrounded the city, and they waited. <coughs> Excuse me. They literally waited until all of their supplies were gone, and then the city opened up the doors and said, you know, we give up, and they came in and sacked the place. And that was only because the, they de demonstrated in 410 AD 
that the traditional perimeter defense was flawed. I always like, you know, being in Canada, we always like to use the bear analogy of, you know, it used to be you only had to be faster than the, the hiker behind you in order to outrun the threat. But the funny thing is, is the threats these days are pretty much everywhere. Oddly enough, those bears tend to be, you know, anyway. <laughs> now, the other idea is looking back, um, there was a guy I used to work with years ago, and his whole idea was that anybody who violated information security policy within the organization should be fired. And he was absolutely militant about it to the point where it was absolutely disturbing. I referred to him as the flaming sword of justice. <coughs> this guy did nothing to help enable the business. Security is there as an operator to help in, in facilitate the business in a safe and secure fashion. Having it as the limiting factor that's causing all the problems, which I'm sure we've all heard these stories before, is a really unfortunate way to look at things. Security should be an enabler. Because otherwise we're not going to get past this. Data breaches are going to continue to happen. So just by a show of hands, how many people in here are familiar with Amazon's AWS A, uh, S3 buckets? Oh, awesome. How many of you folks, don't put your hand up for this, how many of you folks have them open and world readable? Don't put your hands up. <laughs> this is one of the things that I find time and again. I keep reading these stories about companies that had their data breached and they said, oh, we were hacked. I'm like, no, you actually left the door open. So by default, <coughs> excuse me, by default, these, these uh, S3 buckets are not world readable. They are not accessible you have to actually consciously go in and enable them. The problem is, is most of the times that's happening by somebody who doesn't have a security background. Somebody who has a credit card and was able to spun, spin up instances on AWS, and then boom, you have a problem. And then we have things like Marriott got popped, and this is not to make fun of Marriott in any way, shape, or form, and then there's Cora got popped, and these were both relatively recently. But the thing is, it keeps happening over and over again to all sorts of organizations. No one is immune to it. And this is really interesting statistic from an IDC report is that, you know, 81% of breaches involve weak or stolen credentials. And when I go back to talk about what I was talking about earlier of reusing usernames and passwords, if you are using that, you know, your password of fluffybunny123 on Amazon or another site and that other site gets popped, they can then use those credentials to access your account on Amazon or your financial institution or whatever it happens to be. The porous perimeter is the thing of the day. So the idea of the castle that doesn't scale is real. The perimeter doesn't exist in the way we used to think about it. And we have to gr have a level of maturity where we move beyond that. And the idea that I always had was that the perimeter was the data. And my boss, Wendy Nather, she actually put it in a different way. She said the perimeter is anywhere in access decisions being made. I thought that's absolutely brilliant. And so I liberally steal that, but obviously I have to give her credit because she's awesome. The perimeter is like this. We have remote employees, hybrid clouds, and so on and so forth. These are where all of these decisions are being made. Zero Trust has to focus on the access. Trusted, access, uh, trusted users, trusted devices, and every application that you have to contend with. So. This is a great example. Back in 2012, on, on my site, Liquid Matrix, I started tracking data breaches. And this was something else. At the time, I remember the big one, where was it? This is, there it is. LinkedIn has 6.46 uh, million records that were compromised. It was big news. Now data breaches are in the billions of records. We can do better. And I know what I'm talking about because I've suffered through my own data breach. This is a screenshot from one of the systems, and if you can read the top line, you can figure out where I was working at the time. This was a very public data breach. Thankfully, it was a system that was not connected to anything. It was a marketing web server that got popped. Um, and unfortunately, this group, Root Beer Sec, was good, about, good enough to you know, redecorate for us. And that morning, at 9 o'clock in the morning, my phone started ringing. It was the CBC. It was the Gazette. It was everybody wanted to talk about it. No actual damage was done other than reputational risk. And we did, took it in the shorts for that. And the data breaches keep coming. Here's an example from two years ago. This is a site called informationisbeautiful.net. If you like data visualizations, this site is definitely somewhere you gotta check out. But they did this, this was a couple years ago, and this is just showing 
Um, the, the color combinations here are the uh, blue ones are just average ones and the other ones are ones of note is the, how they categorize it. So two years ago, this is now. This is a relatively uh, older one. They've now since updated it, but it actually looks even worse than this. So I'll go back. This is two years ago. This is now. This problem is getting worse. We can do better. So what's open in Canada? This is fun. So Showdown, how many people here are familiar with Showdown? And oh, okay, if you're not, go check out showdown.io. This is like Google for hackers, it's awesome. Um, it's not so awesome if your stuff is in there. So here's an example of the dashboard for just for Canada. So the ports that are open in Canada are over eight million. So specifically that number. This is how many ports are currently listening online. Now, <coughs> that's not something to get worried about so much as to think that a portion of those are not secure. Let's drill down in Quebec. This is how many ports are currently listening. Not say that they're all insecure, but some of them are. Here's some examples, some open webcams, some compromised databases, some industrial control systems. That number is a bit misleading because one of the vendors in that pool actually makes home routers, <coughs> which are also insecure. So it's not entirely a true telling. Uh, they figured that out after the fact. But it's really cool. You can actually go through and find warehouses and all sorts of things online. I found several pictures of people's bedrooms, and I opted not to post those because, you know, reasons. Um, really, people have to get uh, more of an education and do a better, we have to collectively do a better job of getting the message across. So zero trust network value proposition, we have to look at devaluating stolen credentials. If somebody is able to uh, do a database dump, get all the usernames and passwords, that has limited financial uh, viability for the attacker if there's a second factor involved. They aren't able to actually use them to compromise the site because they can't get that other second factor, whatever it happens to be. We need to remove low-hanging fruit. So if we go back and look at that, that two plus million ports that are listening in Quebec alone, that an example of some, some subset of those are inherently vulnerable. This is something that we can do a better job of because, because it doesn't have to be easier for the attacker. I like making the attackers work for their lunch because they're making me work. So. Uh, Apparently, I lost the letter T somewhere, but trusted access is the way we look at it at our company, at Duo. So very much the same thing. It's just we like to prefer to call it trusted access as opposed to zero trust because it's more of a positive angle. So when I was talking about before 2007, when Jericho came out with their deep parameterization talk, back in 2003, I was at a power company, and we were talking about doing bastion hosts. More specifically, I was talking about doing bastion hosts and doing away with it because it was an open network, basically. I could sit in the, uh, at my desk and I could query SCADA control systems. That shouldn't ever happen. So I said, okay, we have to do network segmentation and then Bastion hosts all the laptops and desktops so we don't have to worry about them in that uh, as much as we do. I was able to escape that meeting with my life, which was fantastic because the team that would have had to support that, they were not fans of that particular idea. All too often, we look at the DMZ as the hard shell, and everything in there is it's, it's like a Tootsie Pop. It doesn't, this doesn't help anybody, because once they can get through that initial perimeter, it's all over but the crying. So when you're looking at doing zero trust, or in the way we put it, trusted access, we want to make sure that you're setting your expectations, because if you don't properly articulate what you're trying to get to at the end of job, this is going to be a real problem. And you'll have all sorts of vendors that come and say, oh, you need this with the blinky lights, or you need this for over here. Oh, look, we have a t-shirt. None of that really matters unless you clearly define what you're trying to accomplish. You need to set your expectations. You need to clearly define what it is you're trying to solve before you ever talk to a vendor. Within your own organization, you want to aspire to that trusted access. You want to definitely go forward and make it a mantra to get to that. And it's a game of increments. Don't look at it as there's only one way to get to the end of it. You want to make sure that you celebrate each individual win. And it's an iterative process. There is never an end state where we go, oh, we got zero trust, we got trusted access, we're good. It doesn't work that way. It is a constant iterative process. And when you're determining those priorities, you want to make sure they are priorities that make sense within your organization because you have to sell this within your own organization. You have to have folks that are championing it 
not only at yourself, but within other parts of the organization. Somebody from procurement, somebody from finance. Some, if you can get them on side, they become voices for you and help you get your message across. So think about it this way. When you're looking at these stolen credentials, it's like, how do you stop stolen credentials that are actually legit if you don't know they've been stolen? Let that sink in for a second. You want to verify your users. You want to verify the devices they're using and protect each individual ac application. Because if you're doing all of this, it makes it so much harder for the attacker to ever cause you any sort of harm. You want to move beyond that. So it, oh, it's a little bit of a product slide, so I apologize for that. I wasn't meaning to put that in there. But anyway, suffice to say, you want to make sure that you are marrying up the users in your database to the device inventory you have with the applications. All of these moving parts are things that we've known how to do for years. This is just a way to link them all together. So if you have a user that's on a laptop that you don't have in your inventory, they, they'll get dumped into a different uh, setting than you would normally, or you could have them blocked out of your network altogether. Depending on what geo-block they're coming from, you could block them that way. I, like, I hate geo-blocking, but it is an option that's available to you. Um, case in point, I used to do work for a defense contractor back um, in the 90s. And in that particular instance, we were getting constantly attacked by a country that r rhymes with China. Um, and we just had no business with them whatsoever. There was no reason any of that traffic should be coming in. So we, I went to the step of putting in as part of a Bogon list on the edge routers. That dumped that entire net block. It didn't stop them from coming to attack from other av avenues, but it removed so much of the noise. It's all about looking through and doing an iterative process to help improve your standing. You want to have those users trusted. You want to make sure that you have users that are supposed to be accessing your systems. In one company that I worked at years ago, we did an audit of all of the accounts on our network. And we went through and we found there was about 20 to 30 accounts that were still active that shouldn't have been, including one for someone who had left the company 10 years earlier and had since passed away. That account was still active and had basically God-level credentials on the entire network. If somebody had known that password, they could have gone completely nuts on the network. So making it harder for the attackers is the key. You want to have that second, off, a second factor in there to make sure that a user did, loses their username and password, sticks it on a post-it note, leaves a notebook on a train. None of that is going to be part of the problem because you have that other factor that the attacker wouldn't have. <coughs> And you want to make sure you're using trusted devices. So if you have a BOIOD environment or you have an environment where you have set out your uh, asset inventory and you clearly articulate what it is, you can make sure you manage those devices and how they access. Trusted devices get access to everything. Untrusted devices only get dumped into a DMZ or however you happen to articulate. Yeah. Let's try that again. However you happen to art ar architect your network. <laughs> You can even actually bring it down to the level where you can actually make sure that systems are patched to current or N minus one. So an example here is this is a, a Firefox install that was 31 year, uh, days, sorry, 31 days out of date, and it was forcing them to upgrade this before they would get grant access to the network, which can be really frustrating for people like me on the road, but it does work because every once in a while it says, oh, you haven't updated your browser in six, seven days, and meanwhile you're in some country that you really don't want to be updating from. So it's one of those things where it's like, this is something that can be proactive in encouraging the users to actually upgrade your systems or forcing them to upgrade if that is something that is uh, of critical nature. It helps remove the poor hygiene. It can also enforce BYOD devices, BYOD devices to be of a certain level in order to play. So if you say, okay, you can access it, but you're only gonna have access to this part of the network, but you also wanna ensure that they are at least this high to ride the ride. And you wanna make sure that you're get marshalling the access to all the applications that you use for your business critical en endeavors, whether it's external to the environment or internal in the environment. If you can manage those all from a central location, this is a win. And you can get granular right down to the weeds on the different types of ways you can lock these devices down or the services that people are allowed to access. Trusted access, you want to look at building an asset inventory, both <coughs> devices and your users. You want to have proper user management and making sure that not everybody has access to everything. You don't want that one particular director of whatever having access to all sorts of sites that have nothing to do with business critical or you just let everybody have access to everything. These are the options you have available to you. 
device management, defined repeatable processes. If you take nothing away from here other than one thing I'll talk about in a minute, defined repeatable processes are things that you can do in your environment today. You can sit down, de de develop this process, and it helps reduce the rate of incidents. One company I worked at, the CIO mandated that we were taking one year off no new projects. It was only maintained. And in that time, during that year, we, and when it rolled out ITIL, our rate of incidents, we were able to track it, dropped 74%. That was fantastic. And that was just because we had defined repeatable processes in place. You want to be able to look at your user and your entity behavior. You can look all that information that you collect and go back and say, oh, what is going on here? And network zone segmentation. I shouldn't be able to sit at, at my desk at a financial institution in Canada and query the mainframe and nobody knows. This has happened. I won't say which bank. The authentications must flow. Supply chain's a great example, and this is one of submarine cables, just to get the idea across. These are all links around the world of various different types of networks. These are the kind of things that we have to look at and then apply that to the supply chain of all of our software. If you're rolling out an application and you're using open source libraries, do you know that those libraries are up to current? Are they patched? Do they have problems? When is the last time that repository was updated? Was it 10 years ago? Might be something to look at. So one of my last uh, stories that I'll throw out here was I had a, uh, one organization that was at, we had a pen test that we had engaged, and 9 o'clock in the morning, a phone rang, and they said, okay, we're ready to get going. I said, okay, great. Put the phone down, grab my paper, ha have my coffee, sitting there reading away, and at 9.14, 14 minutes later, the phone rings, and I'm like, no, this can't be right. Sure enough, it was the pen test team, and they had not only gained access to the network, but they had actually taken over every router and switch in the network as well as the Active Directory and they were in the process of tearing it all apart. This was an uh, environment that we thought was secure. We were wrong. Always test. So going back to talking about the ports that were open, this is a great example. I went through uh, SSH and there was about you know, 250,000 different SSH ports that were listening in Quebec alone. So this is one particular one that was vulnerable and how badly is it vulnerable? These are the vulnerabilities with that one SSH port that was listening. This is the kind of thing that we have to be concerned about. We have to make sure that we're having proper hygiene for our systems, our applications, and so on. You want to encrypt all of your data? Always a good idea. There are better ways to do things. There are much better ways to authenticate than using the good old venerable static password. Now, WebAuthn is a open standard that was put out by WC, uh, W3C uh, back in April of 2018. If you do nothing else other than the other thing I talked about, look this up. This is a great way to do authentication for your applications that allows you to do two-factor authentication to your web apps. Read about this. I highly recommend that you look it up. Web Auth N. So, to sum it up, assume everything is on fire. All networks are hostile. You need to figure out how to establish trust. You need to build that trust. Reduce your threat surface because when I did pen testing in the past, it was never some wonderful, glorious zero day to get into the networks that I was testing. It was always something really simple. And it was something that was imminently avoidable. You want to continually validate. You want to make sure that you keep things simple. One organization I worked at, we were building out this wonderful network between two different physical sites. And they wanted to have all this BGP routing to one, the other. And I said, why are we doing this? The sites are 35 kilometers apart. So it was something that we were able to simple it, make it much more simple. It doesn't have to be complex for the sake of complexity. Asset inventory, user management, defined repeatable processes, and network zone segmentation. Those are the three right there for the shopping list. The idea of the flaming sword of justice is a deprecated notion for security folks. We, are, we can move away from this. We can move and do things in a secure fashion to enable the business. We don't need to throw that holy hand grenade of Antioch every time there's something going wrong. That being said, I would like to say thank you to QuadBridge and everyone for attending today and uh, taking the time to listen to me. And if you have any questions, you can reach me at uh, email or Twitter or what happens. And thank you very much. <laughs>